Hi, I'm Jeremy Veenstra Vanderweel. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist who primarily sees people with diagnoses of autism from two or three year olds all the way into adulthood. Thus far, most of the risk factors that have been identified have to do with either pregnancy or birth. So being born very prematurely or having complications around birth. Some um, risk factors in, in moms like uh, diabetes, like being overweight, um, certain medications or infections during pregnancy clearly increase the likelihood of a later diagnosis of autism. I importantly, the data do not point to parenting or other factors after birth um, that significantly increase likelihood of autism. Genetics is now understood to contribute significantly to autism. Some of that data is from twin studies where you see that identical twins who share 100% of their DNA are much more likely to share a diagnosis of autism than fraternal twins um, who share 50% of their DNA and are much less likely to share a diagnosis, about as likely as, as any other sibling. Um, so that's useful in understanding that genetics contributes, but now we also have additional data, which is that if you send all the genetic testing we know how to send currently, you have about a 10 to 20% chance of finding a, a genetic variant that explains not all of somebody's autistic traits, but a large majority of them. People often wonder if autism is different in children and adults. Uh, importantly, the way we define uh, autism spectrum disorder is designed to really span across developmental levels. And that could apply to somebody who is 18 months old and somebody who's 80. Uh, and importantly, could uh, be used to describe somebody who's unable to speak, as well as somebody who speaks fluently. Um, and so that means that there's a, a very wide range that you see, and obviously that changes as people age. Um, but importantly, it isn't just uh, chronologic age, it's developmental age, people's um, cognitive abilities, people's ability to communicate. I sometimes get the question, what happened to the Asperger's diagnosis? Um, and there are a couple of answers to that question. The simplest one is that we haven't been very good at defining where the edges are when we talk about the autism spectrum. So historically, the Asperger's diagnosis was used to describe people who have no trouble with uh, learning, no trouble with speaking, um, and still clearly have all, all of the difficulties that you see in people with a diagnosis of autism. Uh, in truth, that's not a great description. Um, it's talking about something that's sort of on an edge. And so things changed about 10 years ago to describe autism spectrum disorder um, as a broad diagnosis. And within that, to capture areas that people have particular strengths and difficulties, but to leave out this idea of a separate diagnosis called Asperger's. Uh, autism is diagnosed much more frequently in men than in women and in boys than in girls. Um, and part of that seems to be that autistic traits are just more common um, in males than in females. Um, that seems to be true whether or not somebody has a diagnosis or not. Uh, but part of it also seems to be about what we're used to seeing. Um, and you can think about that as bias, or you can think about that as history. Um, but we are better at looking for autistic traits in boys. Um, we characteristically uh, expect to see things like interests in trains as opposed to something that might be seen more commonly in a girl, uh, like interest in particular sets of dolls. Um, and we're more used to thinking of somebody as autistic if they present as male. Can you grow out of autism? I think that this is a difficult question because people mean different things when they say grow out of. Uh, we do see people who have what is oftentimes described as quote unquote an optimal outcome in autism spectrum disorder. That usually means somebody who had a diagnosis of autism when they were two or three or four years old and by the time they're adult may have some autistic traits but may no longer be impaired by them. And that's a critical part of our, uh, our, our application of diagnoses that we think about whether this is something that's getting in somebody's way. So we don't usually think that autism goes away, but what we imagine is that there are plenty of people who have autistic traits who may not be significantly impaired or held back by them. 
Like in many areas of medicine, there are disparities in diagnoses based on race and ethnicity. Uh, I think people want to know if that's improving, and there is evidence that uh, the likelihood of, of an accurate diagnosis is going up in Black or African American children and seems to be going up also in Latina children. Uh, that is not an indication that autism is increasing. It's an indication that people are being appropriately screened and identified who didn't used to be. Uh, it's still not as good as it needs to be. And we also know that in addition to racial and ethnic disparities, there are disparities based on uh, income, on area of the country. We need to do better. We need to see universal screening and appropriate assessment as early as possible so that kids can get into services. Many people have questioned whether vaccines contribute to autism. It, it's understandable because uh, babies receive vaccines and, and toddlers receive vaccines around the same time period when people are seeing initial emergence of autistic traits. Importantly, vaccines do not contribute. In fact, vaccines are one of the ways that we actually understand how to prevent autism. Uh, German measles, rubella, is a cause of autism when exposure happens during pregnancy, and vaccines prevent that. So ironically, despite all of the concerns, vaccines are a way that we can prevent autism.